Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie. It's Friday Night Racing on a Friday afternoon if you're getting us live on our social channels or it's Friday Night Racing at 8 o'clock on News Talk every Friday night. That's Tardy bet from Johnny a little bit later on. Still looking for that elusive winner, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit of rugby and a little bit of horse racing today because Sean O'Brien is here with us. Sean, how are you doing? Good. Very good. You're very welcome. Thank you. You've um, you've got a bit of a golden touch at the minute with the the horses. Um, how long I, did you? I touch it because it's certainly not happened for me at the moment. Maybe <laughs> how long like did you have a runner in Nighttown? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Still running. Yeah. All right. Um, but onwards and upwards. Um, but I, the elusive winner is a bit harsh. We we did have a good start about two months ago. A long time ago. Yeah. We, first week out. We this will be a better weekend, Sean. <laughs> yeah. You hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you own or are involved in three separate horses, right? Yeah, correct. But Rowetta is the the hot one. Rowetta is the hot one at the minute. Yeah. Hopefully, the other two come good very soon. But yeah, she's she's been very impressive the last while. Tell us your racing background. What's the crack with you? Um, Dad used to have a few brood mares at home. Um, was into point to pointing. That's where he used to bring us. That was his day out. A uh, few beers, and um, we went since we were young. The whole family used to go. Yeah. And point to point's mad. I've only been once up in Donegal. It's like this kind of other world that you don't know exists. Yeah, highly it's recommend it. It's proper racing, but it's 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 tough. Like yeah, point to point is tough. And um, the day I went, it lashed rain from the side. It was like one of those kind yeah. of why do people? And then when you the, obviously the rain. Past in 10 minutes, you're like, this is amazing. It's like a little carnival in a small field. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a cool place to be, good atmosphere, lots of, I suppose, ordinary people just trying to enjoy the whole day, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, if your dad had brood mares, did he have, did he breed horses to, to were you riding, were you, I can't imagine. Yeah, I used to hunt a lot when I was younger. Right, okay, yeah. 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 Um, got a bit big when I was 16 or 17, but um, that was the last time I remember hunting, yeah. But uh, yeah, I used to hunt an awful lot. Right. Um, so had a had a kind of a keen interest in horses as well growing up, but more so was towards like the cattle and farm and stuff at home. I, I grew fonder of as as I got older, but uh, yeah. yeah, there was always there was always horses around, and he he had a big interest in him. Um, still does to a certain extent. Loves loves uh, putting a couple of euros each way on a horse uh, most days. So are, are most um, farmers kind of frustrated horse trainers somewhere along the way? They're like, geez, I wouldn't mind a little bit. They just had some one big horse, and I could forget about this. My yeah, father is a trainer. That's, that's the dream, like. Yeah. My father, I think he was a frustrated gambler rather than, uh, <laughs> but he's a farmer as well. <laughs> he just stint in London where he uh, turned to the horses for a while, but he realised that it wasn't uh, going to be sustainable, so he came home. Yeah. All our fathers have one of those stories in the in the mm. yeah, which we won't bring to air because otherwise I won't be able to go home <laughs> in the future. And and so like at that stage, do you kind of think you you want to be involved in that or like? You know, is farming always going to be the thing you do? And are you thinking at that stage you wouldn't mind having some horses on the side as well? Yeah, it was well, farming was always, is always a thing I'm going to be involved in. I'd say um, for the rest of my life. But the horse side of things kind of came um, eight or nine years ago, probably to me. Um, a friend of mine had a horse, got involved with that, um, worked out pretty well for us. And then, you know, I'd, I have a keen interest in it. Um, don't get to as many race meetings as I'd like to, obviously, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, just interested in it as such, and it's just about to crack for me more so than anything else. Okay, I was going to ask, is it like specific to National Hunt, or would you be interested in flat racing, or like, does it matter? Is it really about kind of getting everybody out together at the same day with the same? Yeah, challenges? that's what it's about more. I suppose National Hunt is probably what I more enjoy look, looking at, and uh, there's a better buzz about it, I think, but the flat is kind of starting to take over now a little bit too. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of money involved in the flat now, and a lot of really good horses out there. So, um, you know, it's all, it's all integrated into one, really. Yeah, no, totally. Your horses are with um, Jessica Harrington, and I was just, like, in my head, Moon and, and Tola are right beside each other, so, like, that's a handy spin for you. Yeah, yeah, it's handy. Um, yeah, it's handy. It's, I suppose Jessica's yard as well has grown a lot over the last few years. And, um, fair setup, isn't it? Fair setup. A pile of horses are now, and very good horses in the yard, and she's flying as well at the minute. So, uh, glad I'm with her uh, <laughs> right now. Anyway, it's, like, it's handy to have this like world class operation right on your doorstep. <laughs> Correct. That definitely helps. We're uh, we're making a documentary actually. Kevin Caban was down in the uh, in the yard this week and uh, so that's going to be coming out in the next week or two. Let's play you this bit though because this is uh, the first race, the first race of Rubet. I think you had her a couple of days, did you at that stage? You just, you just... Yeah, well it wasn't a couple of days but it was, uh, it was a couple of weeks. I think. Right, okay, so just in time for Galway. Just, just in time for Galway, yeah. And I think Mark Enright's on board and this is what happens. Have a look. In the 
the toad out of GBF Mare's handicap. It's time to get the leader. Rovette on the outside as these two now begin to settle down to fight it out. And it's Rovetta getting the better of a stable companion. Time to get the Lake Milan Clementina. And Rovetta, who got in his first reserve, is powering up the hill for Mark Enright. Yeah, so... Um, we had Mark Enright on the show and he said that he took a phone call from you beforehand and he was like, no, no, listen, I don't think she's got any chance today. So he said he ignored your phone calls for the hours the hours afterwards just in case you were a bit pissed off. Yeah, Fish, we call him Fish, Mark Enright, that's his, that's his nickname, Fish, but uh, yeah, I, I was delighted more so for him as well, um, just being a, a close friend of mine and, um, you know, to get a winner in Galway, to start off his week like that, yeah. you know, it was brilliant, but he'd done, he done a great job on her and in fairness, um, he wouldn't be. He wasn't over enthusiastic before the before the race, <laughs> but he wasn't giving anything away either. You know, he yeah. said once once he had her settled in the race, it's that she flew home. You know, yeah, so. yeah. No, we had him in the week after actually, and he was delighted with it. It was kind of uh, he yeah, didn't. No. He, he was a bit concerned about what your reaction might have been. Probably still hung over from Galway after that. So. He's definitely hung over after Limerick as well, one dollar Ireland. But um, like most people, dream of a winner in Galway to have two winners in the week at the one horse. Yeah, some some yeah, going. Yeah, like. yeah no, it's going. What is that? What's that process? So the the. Um, Jessica comes to you and says, this guy's going, let's get him back out there straight yeah, exactly, away. Exactly, yeah. Most, most trainers have uh, double up maybe in Galway um, from the start of the week to the end of the week. So there's there's always a few horses that they can throw out there. So yeah, Jessica basically said, look, he's fresh, fresh as the age as she is. Um, you know, this morning, that was the day after. Um, we're going to put him back in at the weekend. And on, on you go, we yeah. said. So um yeah, delighted, and then you know everyone was asking me, surely he doesn't, have, surely she won't have a chance today, and I said, <laughs> watch this space. So uh, I was absolutely delighted because she she improved an awful lot throughout the, the first race. Yeah, um, and she was fresh the next day. So but that's what I was looking at it anyway. Yeah, well, there seems to be, and like again with Kate Harrington, and she was kind of talking about that how they tell and how they judge the horses are getting fitter and fitter, and they do preseason training. All that stuff is a mystery to us, but clearly there's a science from their perspective to it. Yeah, of course there is. It's, it's, it's like treating a human being. You know, you have to get them to a point where they're ready to play. Yeah. Um, and when they're ready, then away with you. Yeah. There's only a four-year-old filly as well, so there's, yeah. there could be still plenty there, you know. Mm. Um, and she's by So You Think, and So You Think was a horse. I love about racing, you follow the horse and then you follow his progeny down the line and one of them is Rovetta. Yeah, are you into all that kind of stuff as well? Like, I, I'm not, to be honest. Yeah. I'm not. If I like the look of a horse or, you know, it That's something you get into over time, me. I think. Yeah, yeah. Because exactly. if Rovetta has, like, her own, yeah, you know, she, horses down the line... Yeah, if she was to go like, now or, or yeah. to, to have a, you know, a foal down the line when she's when she's finished up, like, then, then you'd have a keen interest in that side of things. Yeah. But, um, not really now with me, no. It's, it's Would a, you breed one? On, the, on, um, on your ample land in Tolo. Yeah, you know, it might, might, might go down that route eventually. We'll see. <laughs> that's, when, that's when everything changes again, I think. Yeah. In what way? I'd say it's like nearly the equivalent of just having your first child in terms of horse racing, parlance, like that it's like you had that horse before its inception, you chose what stallion to go, and the stallion might be because you wanted to mix um, stamina with speed on the dam, and the sire side might be a stamina that is first season, so he's fairly cheap, he's unproven. Mm. And then you follow that progress. You actually see the you know the foal after it's born straight away. You wait two years if it's a flat horse for it to run. Four years if it's a, if it's a jumps horse minimum. There'll be a lot of ups and downs along the way. And uh, I'd say it's an, I've never bred a mare, but it's something down the line would be a beautiful thing to do. Yes, it, and 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 it's the possibilities are relatively endless. You don't know how good or bad the horse is going to be. You just need the farmland. Just need the farmland, yeah. Um, my father, um, our land wouldn't be as good as it is in Tolo, so our land is planted now. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, you got involved in ownership fairly early on. So, like, one of the things that um, I, we were talking about this last week, we were at Kilbegan and we met a couple of different syndicates. Um, one of them was like a, a bunch of guards who have like 120 members. It's a racing club and there's 90 different shares, so you can share in a share. You don't actually have to have a full share yourself. And then there was another syndicate, like, it's possible to do this on a shoestring if you want to, if you've got enough people involved, or you can go the whole hog and buy your own horse. There's a kind of a full scale of people of ways that people can access this. Definitely, yeah. Like um, they, sh they say, you know, you're you're very unfortunate if your first bet wins. Like, and the first horse I got involved in actually turned out to be very good. So that that was much to my uh, misfortune because I've been involved, kind of, or certainly uh, hooked with it ever since. And first horse we had was Operation Houdini, and. Um, 
there were about 10 of us involved, 20 when he was winning. And um, he went on to be like second in, in a, and thrown out second in a Cork National. And he was 8 to 1 for the Welsh National and he was favoured for the Paddy Power. Right. So he cost like, I think he was 14 grand, he never won. And uh, we thought he could, he took him about 12 goals to actually win a race of any description. He kept coming second and then he just improved. And we had days out like at the biggest with Chepstow, Navin, Leopardstown. Fairy House, and we became great friends. Like you know, I've, I'd say I was at four weddings of syndicate members, and um, unbelievable crack. And like what I would say is, if the horse is any good, the race itself is only it's only a part of the actual story. So the fun you have now, particularly with the proliferation of WhatsApp now, because you can you can have great crack along the way all week. You know, debating will the ground be right? Who's going to ride him? Trainer is no good. Trainer is great. He's telling us lies, he's telling the truth, like he's optimistic, he's pessimistic. And um I've I think if, if you if you can do it cheaply, like if you if you get ten people it'll cost about hundred and twenty quid a month each. Yeah, it's, it's a, very doable. It's like. totally doable. Yeah, that's that's the that's the main thing with a syndicate. It's it's affordable for everybody. Um, you know, it's it's about fourteen to sixteen hundred euros a month to train an animal. So if you have twenty people in that over the year, you know what I mean? It's twenty yeah. grand Roughly, um, you know what I mean. So it's a grand each if you're twenty in it, up to twenty in a syndicate. So yeah. it's it's cheap enough for for the entertainment you're going to get and the buzz and the crack you're going to have, and you know the days out you'll have hopefully. You and obviously prize money. Exactly. exactly. Rovetta's, you know, cooed about fifty grand mm. already. Like not bad. Like yeah, it's good. <laughs> like the syndicate are, are delighted. Like yeah, you know of course. I mean? so. so you missed the first one. Were you there for the second one in Galway? No, no. <laughs> you missed the boat. <laughs> missed the boat. I wasn't. I couldn't. I was training that week and, yeah. and I wasn't tra traveling down on Sunday. I was wrecked after the week. So yeah. Um, you know, I was watching, watching carefully. Though. Are you going to be allowed now to go, or will you be one of those like, no, he's not allowed to come. He's a jinx. And well, would you believe I didn't? I didn't go the last day purposely. The Cora. I actually said that in the right. Cora. I was. They, they were ringing, going, "Are you going today?" And I said, "I'm actually staying away purposely." So I didn't. So I probably won't go. Oh no! Did you finish second or third the last time, or did you win one again? One oh, again. So it's worth three, three, three. Yeah, yeah, three. All right. Three, three. So um. Yeah, so all's oh, good. She she won off seventy nine the last day on the flat. She's gone up to eighty eight now, which is bringing her into the black type territory. That is kind of jargon for a lot of people. Mm. But black type is basically if she finishes placed in a listed or group race um, down the line at the sales. When you come to her page in your book, there'll be black type. Um, it'll literally be black type that this mare is a black type, and that makes her quite a bit more valuable. Yes, right. So Happy that's days. that's definitely achievable. Yes, like. that's that's achievable. So that's that's probably what we're hoping for now. Like she's entered in the stall next week. Right. Um, you go to that. No, I won't travel down that far. And then Champions Weekend is well. maybe, maybe back to Galway. Maybe back to Galway. She's right. entered the Lartigue actually, which th this is this is a special race. So the Lartigue, I'm a bit of a rail nerd. The Lartigue was a <laughs> was a, a monorail in it was Ireland's only monorail, possibly one of the first monorails in the world. But it was it ran from the Stole to some other part of Kerry. But it was a very um, it was a very um, unique thing at the time, but they named the, the hurdle after us. And there's a Lartigue Museum in right. Mistole. But it also honours Liam Healy, the race, um, since Liam died, the photographer who was from Mistole, really, really popular. Of course, um, Pat and Liam Jr. now are carrying the Healy name with all the photographs, but it, it would be a special race to win. And I'd say she will be, if not favourite, you know, bang up there at the top of the betting and be lovely nice. race to win. And yeah. it's worth a nice bit of money. Yeah. And so is that is that a graded or a listed race? It's so grade B hurdle, mm -hmm. handicap mm -hmm. hurdle. Is that good so enough to get to the black type? No, so like she, the black type she well, she could achieve black type, but the black type she'd more likely be looking for is on the flat, but she could do it over jumps as well. Okay. It's thirty two and a half grand for the winner. So Happy days. It would be all right. And so hang on, so this is over hurdles. Two miles. Two yeah. miles over and hurdles. Only for four year olds. Okay, so she can become a flat horse again. She she can mix it. She can mix up. That's pretty unusual, isn't it? No, it's th that's it's happening more and more. That's what happened in Galway. Like so, we were hurdles the first day, and flat, flat flat on the Sunday. Okay, be like you playing rugby and a bit of hurling at the weekend, kind of you know. Yeah, but yeah, uh, she yeah. like that's the beauty of her. She has, if you have a horse like that, she has two options to make. Talented, talented mare. Yeah. yeah. So how did you pick her? Like what, what's that process? Apart from getting a bit lucky, but like yeah, I suppose like well. We didn't pick her as such. As uh, Harrington was who, who who picked her out first. So Kate obviously saw something in her uh, at the sales. They bought her for three grand. That that story. That's all on the. That's all out there. That's yeah, like yeah, amazing yeah. Kind so of. This is how this process works. Exactly. So she was uh, very cheap, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then came came to 
came to me with her and said... Um, this is good, have a look. Yeah, have a look. So, and that's where it started, really, to be honest. Yeah, um, happy days. And so, so yeah, you get, you get, you get, you get lucky uh, every now and again. Um, do you get to name her? Is that, that's your name? No. No. She, was, she came from France, Pascal Barry used to train her, so uh, she was named whatever the name uh, means. Um, um, but if you move a horse to Hong Kong, you can change its name. You, do, you obviously named the Tullow Tank, or did somebody name that for you? That was actually, that was, yeah, I had a share in the horse yeah. as well. Um, he was a right horse. Yeah, he was a right horse. And how that came about was when they were naming him, they rang me to ask, could they, could they use the name? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, for a leg. I said, you can. You had paid <laughs> exactly. trademark. So, um, yeah, he was, uh, he, he worked out brilliantly as well. And he wouldn't want to be no good now. No, no. no. <laughs> She's a total like tank. myself, he's injured as well. <laughs> <laughs> what about Koolaboola? Is that, that was another one of yours? Koolaboola, yeah. Um, another one of ours um, didn't... Didn't work out great for us. Right, that's so the other side of this that we should just yeah, warn people. Yeah, that's the other side. Like, yeah, but sure, that's that's all. Value of part, your investment may rise as well as for fall as well as rise. Yeah, exactly. But um, no, another nice horse, but uh, wasn't did, didn't didn't do the trick for us really. And are you going down to like check on the horse semi regularly and kind of just have a look and? Yeah, I pop into the yard every now and again. She's a great set up there now. They've built more stables. Yeah. Hamptons have and um, new walker and new galloping and. Um, you know, it's really kind of grown down there a lot, so and, and it'll continue to do so. I think when she's in this kind of form. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. Sorry, Jared, this um, it's not all about going to the races. Like, say, if you if you have a horse say with Damien English, you can go up to the beach and watch him on the beach uh, in the morning exercising, and go to the yard afterwards. And it's it's actually a lovely, lovely experience to see your horse and see the horse in the yard and just feel part of it. Yeah, I mean, obviously you grew up around horses and animals, so it's probably less of a... a, a, a <laughs> you're not like, wow, I haven't seen this before. Yeah, but yeah. like uh, at the same time, they are like the best horses in the world. Half a century, it looks like it's going to be a, one of... Yeah, one it's a horse. Like, yeah. special horse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can we talk to you a bit about rugby? You can, yeah. How are you right. getting on? What's the prognosis at the moment? Good, yeah. Um, yeah, coming along. Um, I suppose... I know where I, I stand more so in the next couple of weeks, but um, yeah, feeling good. Um, after doing an awful amount of work the last uh, eight, nine weeks. Um, so yeah, coming coming right now and uh, back on the field, hopefully next week or the week after, and, and then take from there to see how the body is. And are you relatively calm about this whole process now because it, it's something that you're so used to, like coming back from injury, or are you, are you at your wit's end thinking, oh, Jesus? I'm... <laughs> I'd be lying if I didn't say I just want to get out now and play kind of yeah. thing. But these are the crucial weeks where you need to be patient and be calm say to yourself, it. look, you'll be back when you're fully right. Don't go back a week too early or two weeks too early Yeah. Um, and do something silly. So, you know, I've, I've learned over the years, I suppose, to have a bit more patience now and go back when I'm fully right. You've seen your teammates have like all sorts of different experiences where some have had to retire early. Some have looked like they're on the verge of retirement and then mm. come back kind of with like... Um, you know, there was definitely a lot of doubt about Keane Healy's future, and now here he is back, absolutely dominant, one of the best yeah. players in the world in his position. So, like, you, are you prepared for any eventual outcome at this point, or do you kind of just have to go? I'm ignoring all the negatives and going straight for the positives. Yeah, I don't. I don't look at a negative uh, as a negative anyway. If if something like that had to happen, you know what I yeah. mean? That's that's just life. Um, and you know, I have to cross that bridge when I come to it. Um, but you it was down the road. Though. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But. You know, any day we go out, you could be, you know what I mean. That could be it. But you know what I mean. It's it's you're managed in such a way now that you know you should be ready to play. And I'm feeling so fit at the minute, and I've still a couple of weeks to go. Yeah. Uh, feeling very strong. You know what I mean. So I'm probably in the best physical shape I can be in right now. So I've no doubt in my head what I'm going to do when I come back and, and how long I'll, I'll, I'll be able to play for going forward. This is why we put such a massive emphasis on the last three, four months of training and, and getting my body in the best possible shape possible. And is it something that you're concerned about from a mental perspective that like the next time, um, you know, should even just watching, say, Keno Sullivan in the All-Ireland Football Final, the first sprint is the time his hamstring goes. And it must have been in his head that when he opens up and reading Rob Kearney talking about there were times last season when he was like, I don't really want to get to a full sprint, but if yeah. I don't, then there's going to be a try or I'm not going to get the ball. Yeah. And you just have that thought in your head, I actually have to do this. Yeah, you'd feel, you'd feel sorry for someone like in a, in a final. Yeah. But he's had ongoing hamstring issues, I think. He's after working so hard throughout the year and, and playing so well throughout the year. Next minute you get to that stage and you could be just after overdoing it and training or, or something like that. But it's a bit different for... For for me coming back in now, I've had such a a good run without a games. I've had a lots of time to work on different aspects. 
you know what I mean, and getting myself strong in all the different areas. So yeah. mentally wise, I just want to get out there and get back into it and roll up the sleeves again and, and get back playing some good rugby. Two questions about that. The the one about where you're like, look, that's just life and if, if it happens, it happens. I presume you wouldn't have thought like that when you were 25 or 26 that you're at a stage of your life now where you're like, look, loads of other stuff going on. Still really desperately want to do this, but like I, I can be at least a little bit more even-handed about it. Yeah, yeah. you think you're invincible at that age. Yeah. You think like, you know, you're loving life. You never, never crosses your mind at all about finishing, but... Yeah, definitely over the past few years and in fairness, Ruby Players Ireland and Leinster and all, they encourage us now to prepare ourselves for life after rugby. Um, so it is a thing that I've probably focused on more so over the last uh, two, three years to make sure I'm in a good place when I do finish. So it's not just you're done and you know what I mean, what, where am I going next? Yeah. You have kind of a, a something, something to look forward to. Yeah. So um, yeah, that always is in the back of your head, but in the short term you're thinking Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. And totally. And the other side of that is that, like, the miles on the clock thing seems to be, particularly in contact sports like rugby, a very realistic thing. There are only so so many times that you can actually hit a rook without your body kind of saying enough. Like, yeah. you've had a couple of years now where you haven't hit the rooks as many times as you probably should have been doing if you were mm. fit. Like, do you feel like there is a possibility that you can have a different end to your career that will go a bit longer than maybe you would have anticipated? Yeah, the break, the, definitely the, the long breaks like this one, there are five, six months, they do give you a bit more time, definitely, I think. So that's what I mean, but when you, when you get these breaks, you try and fix all the other little bits and pieces that were... That's the exciting part of it, that you could bring yourself to another level. Yeah. Do, than, do, than you're at. do rugby players worry about like like of after rugby in terms of just what you put your body through? And I suppose since the professional era, how it has changed in terms of strength conditioning and that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we worry Talk about, about it. Talk about it. Or, yeah, you know. I, I wouldn't have many conversations with any lads about, you know, oh, how's your body going to be afterwards. You, you we're, we're professional rugby players. You know that you're going to have certain things that are, you know, a bit sore or, or so on. We're in a contact environment. You do contact every week. Um, you roll up your sleeves. You know what I mean? It's a tough, it's a tough uh, lifestyle. It's a tough profession to be in. Um, so you're going to have bits and pieces, but... You know, I wouldn't change any of it for the world anyway. I love it. That's what I love doing. I love playing rugby. I love training. Um, I love being out there with all the lads. Um, you know, so those those kind of things are all probably stuff you think about afterwards. I guess your position gives you a bit more longevity than you know a winger or whatever as well, in theory. Well, our position, yeah, back rowers usually we we probably take more impacts than mm. than any other player in the field. I'd say if you were to look at the stats, but. Um, uh, wingers, sure they're only out there hanging, hanging around. They don't do much, do Waiting they? for the ball. Yeah, we're the ones trying to get it for them. <laughs> Sam Warburton's just retired, actually. Like, um, and he obviously had a, a series of uh, really serious injuries that he managed to get back for for the um, last Lions tour. Um, he's been talking about the position of the jacklers and the jackler needing to be protected. Is this something that you've kind of been keeping an eye on? That like as somebody who's centrally involved in that in games? Yeah, well, I have. I've mentioned a few weeks ago um, that, you know, it is probably something that the referees need to have a bit more understanding about in terms of, you know, how long do we have to survive the jackal, for instance? You know, if we survive the first one, is he given, Is he going to give the second lad a chance to, you know, to get us off the ball? Yeah. Or in some cases, some referees are going to give, you, give the third lad a bite of the cherry. So, yeah. um, you know, other than that, so it's again, it's a part of rugby, but it is it is a place where I suppose um, you're putting yourself in a in a vulnerable position, you know, over the ball. But for us, you know, that's what we're we're developed for. That's why we do the strength training, and that's why we practice these skills and training. So it's just another part of the game, um, you know, that we really tr train hard for. So it needs to be protected, then, right? Yeah, well, you could say that about every other facet of the game too, though. That's the, that's the thing, but maybe a little bit of uh, guidance around it yeah. and how long do we have to be there for um, would be my only thing on it but you know what I mean that's that's up to diff different referees di uh, ref it differently anyway so yeah. you're not going to keep everyone happy and uh, Leinster obviously have um, I think it's been described as a target on their backs this year because obviously every game was won last year um, and you were the best team in Europe last year so that means everybody wants to beat you this year like it is something that you guys have experience of some of you definitely have more experience of it than others does that just change the mindset in terms of how you approach every game yeah it does a little bit because when you do win trophies and um, I suppose you win them in the fashion we did last year as well other teams are looking to get that you know the edge on you all the time and to see can they get to that level and 
we're no different. We have to try and stay above the curve now all the time and not let performances dip, um, not let standards slip, you know, and, and make sure we're, we're doing what we're saying we're doing, basically. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a real healthy environment to be in at the minute at Leinster and it, there's so much competition there as well. It's absolutely brilliant to see. Is that the thing that keeps everybody from getting complacent? Well, absolutely, but as well as as being a professional, you you know what I mean. You don't. Want to, I know you say that, but it's like, slip. but human beings, uh, you get slapped in the back, and everybody goes, "You're great." You this get slapped in the back. You get slapped in the back in Leinster as well, or slapped in the face, one or the other. If 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 you're not performing well, or you won't be picked. Yeah. So you know that's the that's the that's the nature of it, and that's the competitive environment you want. Especially your position, like you you were like at the start of last year. Okay, that's okay. Everybody understands exactly what the first choice back row is and then you get injured and suddenly uh, Dan Levy comes out yeah. and is like Lions calibre it's like alright well it's a pretty steep competition now all of a sudden yeah exactly but you look you look at all our back rowers you know they can all play everywhere as yeah. well we have in fairness we're very lucky to have the amount of back rowers we have and yeah. the quality of back rowers we have but that's that's a healthy competition there's a huge respect between the players as well you know what I mean are you a bit like Rowetta then you're going to have to do 6 and 8 and 7 as well week in week out is that well, like I'll do whatever I have to do you know to get back in the team but it's uh, yeah I'm adaptable that way yeah I think you have to Munster going to narrow the gap this year will Munster narrow yeah. the gap yeah I'd say they will I'd say sure they'll, they'll uh, you know I'd say um, the coach I suppose will develop them again this year you know he only came in last year so and a few new players uh, a few good additions, obviously. Um, so from around a tie. Yeah, but well, like it'll be, it'll be competitive as ever. You know, Munster aren't a million miles away from it. How will uh, how will Joey Carberry be welcomed in like Dublin when he plays up here? Do you think? He'd be very welcomed with <laughs> open arms. <laughs> do you talk to um, Joe Schmidt actually about racing? Because not only is Schmidt running tonight in Kilbegan, but uh, Joe has had a winner. I think this week even Ross Gomin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I haven't spoke to him really much about it. I know, he, I know, he's a keen interest in it, obviously, but. Um, we don't get time when you're in camp for you know you're having a coffee with him to talk about horses. He's he's more important stuff when he's on his uh, on his mind. I think he'll be on something next Friday. Yes, yeah, next Friday we're going to be coming live from the Leopardstown Inn from seven o'clock to half eight, and uh, Joe Schmidt's going to be there. Johnny Murt's going to be there. You're going to be there. And John Small, who was one of the many patrons enjoying the beach uh, life at Leopards at Late Late yesterday. Yeah. yeah. How many double footballers are there? Were they having the crack? <laughs> Their Instagram account was definitely one of his colleagues was supposed to go, but um, they're still going. They are. Um, they they've had a hard week. Like you know, the way he was explaining it to me, uh, it sounded a lot harder than any sort of training that Miko would have done with uh, the Kerry teams back in the day. Like a really really hard week. Like the cumulative hours slept would be minimal, minimal. minimal. But um, quite a few of them love their love their racing. And, yeah, um, so. yeah, and um, he 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 particularly does and. Uh, we were we were having a joke about how many um, selfies requests he would get, but it was it was something like I think people are just a bit afraid of him because he gets sent off so often. They don't yeah, but it turns out he's kind of a, a nice, quiet. He's great, he's a great lad, but loves his horses. So he's another lad that uh, that I, I'm kind of working on getting into ownership as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he just I, seems a bit bit wise at the moment. Uh, yeah, well, it, it shouldn't be too long. Um, well, listen, Sean. Best of luck with the recovery from um, injury and stuff, and. Uh, and with the horses. Thanks a minute. Should we be back in Rovetta, Rovetta every time she runs? Is it Rovetta or Ro Ro Rovetta? Rovetta. Rovetta with the V. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you should be. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Checking what mark she's gone up to for uh, <coughs> RT, which like would would definitely be a logical race. One one one, um, and she won in, in Galway um, off hundreds, but she bolted up. So I actually would say she'll be. Quite, whatever Willie has in the race, obviously, you know, your your yeah. fellow Carlo based man, but uh, yeah, she's going to have a big, big chance. Grand, okay, so we'll keep an eye on that one. We'll stick the card up for the 205 at Kempton, and we'll, that's your, you can scooch out there. See, we're very subtle about that, not, not even supposed to mention it. Thanks a million, Sean, thanks for being with us. Um, oh, come here, actually, I meant to ask. Yeah. My, my, my uh, brother in law and his son are dying for tickets for the New Zealand game. So, <laughs> I, I actually, I was. Jeez, that's not what I was hoping to hear. <laughs> but, uh, just, about, just about 100 orders in already. That, that doesn't sound good, Joe. See ya, thanks a million. <laughs> that does not sound good. You, uh, Is yeah. it going to be absolutely impossible to get tickets for that? Uh, well, I mean, it did sell out a long time ago. They that are the top two good. teams in the world. Any chance of winning the World Cup? Ireland. Ireland. I mean, there's the man to ask. I was told by a few good judges that uh, New Zealand could not be beaten um, come the World Cup. We did a piece last week with um, with 
a New Zealand journalist who had already written the piece. Hand us the trophy now, it's a done deal. That piece has got 50,000 views with a lot of New Zealanders angrily commenting on here, shh, stop, stop giving the game away. Really, they're like, but it was slightly chastising him for, no, not at all. No. no they think they're going to do it, of course they do. Here, let's look at the, the 205 accountant. So you picked three races for us this week um, and we are going to have a charity bet uh, courtesy of the tote.com. Yeah. That's going to be in Navin, so we'll get to the Navin one in a minute, but this, these are the big races this weekend. Uh, Kempton and Haydock are the main ones. Well, this race is absolutely insane for a Group 3. Like, this is... I, do, I don't know what you... Like, this would be like uh, Ireland and New Zealand, in, in, but, but classed as a game in front of, like, maybe 5,000 people at a provincial venue, because this is an all-weather track, um, which... Actually, in terms of its future, was was up in the air. But but I mean, if if Kempton Racecourse don't go to see this, um, British Racing's in trouble. In Able running against Crystal Ocean, two of the best middle distance horses in the world, without a shadow of a doubt. In Able would have been. Why is it a Group Three? I don't understand how that happens. So if you've got like the two best horses over a distance, uh, why does this not suddenly automatically become? Yeah, a like, higher rated race. There, there. It, so the 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 rating of the race would depend on. The, um, I think it's like the last five renewals in the average kind of um, rating band. But Enable running in this is kind of like the Tolo Tank kind of having a friendly game before he comes back for, a, you know, whatever, an autumn international. Because um, her main aim would be the Ark. And I, I, I saw her in Shantee last year when the Ark was in Shantee and it was a, it was a pleasure to see her. She, she, she was last year's master. She was last year's Alpha Centauri, if that makes sense. Yeah. She developed into this ridiculously good filly who basically beat the Colts doing handstands. Um, but she hasn't been seen since the Ark. So this is a group three with a view, I would presume, to running in the Ark in a month's time, so you'd imagine she'll be hitting peak feet, fitness come Paris. But she rocks up in the Group 3 and she's taken on the 129 rated Crystal Ocean. Um, now his participation in this is very, very surprising. To, to run a horse of his calibre in a race like this, like, but if you were to say to the owner, like, I'm going to run Crystal Ocean in a Group 3 there at Kempton, should be a penalty kick, and then he's running against an able. So it's just, it's absolutely, like, anomalous to, to a large extent that, that this could happen. But Weekender, who's by Frankel, um, who will probably make the pace in the race. I'm, I'm going to take a stab on him at around about 14, 16 to 1. Because if Enable is a little bit lacking fitness, this horse will stay. He's very, very gutsy. Um, and I imagine that he will make the running. And just at the, at the price, I'm going to give him a little shout. Okay, and why? Why? Because he's, he's a big price in a five-horse race. Um, actually, in terms of his weights, versus, he's getting five pounds off Crystal Ocean, which shouldn't be enough, but, but gives him a bit of a squeak. And he's, he's actually, I think he's still progressing. He stays further. He will, he's very, very game. You can imagine Sheila, as we say in racing, she could blow up in the final furlong or two. She just needs to run a small bit. And stranger things have happened. Um, it wouldn't, it would, would, he would be well able to win a normal Group 3. And this one might be a little bit more difficult, but he has a chance. Okay, all right. So the other races that we want to talk about, uh, the 425 also, Kempton? Yeah, the 425 is uh, a race for two-year-olds. Um, no Irish representation. Um, Aidan O'Brien has 10 sovereigns. Um, actually, and I was quite stupid. This horse is by no name ever. And someone said, this horse is very well named. 10 sovereigns. And I was like... It's like ten sovereigns as part of the lyrics of No Nay Never. Ten sovereigns, right? The landlady's eyes okay, open. Yeah. Right. But he, he's a sensational uh, prospect. But he's not here. But I think Koncheck could do the job for Clive Cox. Get a bit of um, a toe into the race from Quiet Endeavour. Koncheck was actually behind a Bally Doyle trained horse uh, last time, but I think can go uh, better here. Okay, and then Haydock, the 4.15. This is also on Saturday. Without a question, you would think the race of the day until a certain enable rocks up in a Group 3. Um, and that is a bit mad. Is, there, is it just that they wanted to... Like, why would, why would Crystal Ocean not pull out then at that stage? I, I, don't, I don't really know the thinking behind running Crystal Ocean. And it's really, really strange to drop a horse of, of his calibre who's been running in the top grade Group 1 races into a Group 3 in, in the sort of the, the middle slash end of his campaign. Um, I, I, I don't really know the thing. And it's like as if they just wanted a spectacle for the fans. Because this will be. It's a cracker of a race. Um, and the betting will be interesting as well because Enable... It's just how fit is she, but Harry Angel has a terrible record at Ascot, and the last time he was totally upset in the stalls, and basically he lost his race before it started. He's been given a break. Um, Clive Cox has said his work has been impeccable, and he is a class act here. Um, Aidan O'Brien wants Gustav Klimt, who's had a reasonable campaign without winning, but shouldn't be up to this. If, if Harry Angel gets out, he should win. Gustav Klimt's a huge price. 
Yeah, 25 to 1. I wouldn't back him at 50 to 1, 100 to 1. I, it shouldn't be up to it. Um, but he's, just going back to breeding, he's by Galileo, so he would be a very, very rare Galileo Group 1 winner over six furlongs. I think um, Clemmy was the only horse to do that who's um, still in training this year. All right, a reminder, Friday Night Racing is sponsored by GoRacing.ie. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about late time before we get to our charity bet at What a day out. What a day out, it really was. It was just, and there was such a good buzz there. It was now, a lashing rain early in the morning. I, I woke up and uh, it, it, was, it was so grey, like you could barely see the building beside you. And I was like, this does not sound good. But by the time we got to Leighton, got off the train, and it was a lovely, it was like old times. You get off the train and you go to the races, and everyone was, so many people travelling by train. And there was a little bar. Is there a of, stop in Leighton on the day of the races? Leighton, yeah. Right. Um, there's a stop in Leighton full stop. It's, so if, if, if you're the, on the commuter... The Enterprise ain't stop. Oh, so it's one of the commuter trains. It's okay. one of the commuter trains. I think it goes to Drogheda. But if you're on the commuter belt, like the likes of Leighton and Gormanston would be a very attractive place to live because you're by the beach and you're in, in work in, without, avoid, without all the traffic in like under an hour. Yeah. And it's, it's actually a lovely part of, of uh, the world. But uh, So the, the, like, you walk to the track in 10 minutes. Um, it's the only... Uh, racetrack in Europe, I think, run on a beach. Yeah. Um, six races. Um, they have stalls. The races are run over six and seven furlongs. So they sprints. Um, yeah, pr pretty much like. And um, the, the, the most remarkable thing about it was so many English visitors. So and they were there to to race at Leytown and the Melbourne Ten Syndicate. Um, basically, Jamie Osborne trained horses in the main. A load of, I think, quite well off English people. They all. They basically aimed a load of horses at Leytown and had three winners. So they oh, took right. yeah. So the standard of racing at Leytown, because of their interest, has gone up like quite a bit. And um, it, it was just a pleasure to be involved, you know. And it, there was such a good vibe there. Now, if it were rain, and obviously it, it makes a mess of it, but yeah. Um, and what's the difference going as an owner from being a punter and, and like I mean, obviously you're used to going as a journalist. So it's completely different. But like you're going as as an owner, is there just a different vibe to the whole experience? Ah, uh, definitely. And like the horse I was involved in was running in the last as well, which is kind of ideal because it just builds up to it. Um, and it's just, I know it's kind of formulaic, but like talking to the owner, sorry, talking to the trainer and the jockey beforehand as he gets the leg up and you see him in your colours and he shakes your hand and you just feel like you're actually part of it, like you really are. And um, if the horse does happen to win, like I, I have to say, like the first time Operation Houdini won, it was in a moderate enough um, amateur rider's handicap in, in Punchestown. Um, it was some buzz, like it was uh, the fact that he'd been four, he'd been second four or five times. I remember one of the lads in the syndicate. We were getting a bit um, exasperated by it all, and I remember saying to him, um, "What do you make of tomorrow?" And he goes, um, "Sure, we'll be confident. We're always confident, aren't we?" And I go, "Can you can you even afford to back him at this stage?" And he goes, "I can't afford not to back him at this stage," <laughs> and uh, he won. Um, but it's just it's a great buzz, and um, you can see how much it means to the trainer and the owner as well. Even the smaller winners mean a lot. And a winner at Leytown certainly means a lot to a lot of people. And because I'm involved with the Damien English Yard, he trains literally up the beach like a few miles. So it's special for him as well. And I think it's a meeting that he'll target now as well. Yeah, all right. That's great. Um, and definitely next year, I think we'll probably organise a... A jolly up. Yeah. It's the right thing. You're, you're, back, so you're back in Dublin for... Like, we were back in Dublin for... Unfortunately, we were back for the, to watch the Wales game. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a beautiful experience um if i were to recommend one like irish race meeting obviously it would be a bit mad but like Leighton would certainly be a viable one yeah okay so this week with thanks to the tote.com we've got another 100 euro charity bet for the irish injured jockeys um we're going for a simple winner place or each way bet this week coney call in the 410 at navin on saturday a price we're in about 13 to 2 at the moment yeah and i gotta mention um we absolutely bombed on the trifecta um last week but it won out of um, the three. 13 one out of the three. Yeah. Not too bad. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tough one. race now, in fairness. Yeah. You know? But there was a 13 grand dividend. So that we weren't... We were in the, the right... The theory was somewhat correct. Yeah. But we didn't, you know, but, you know, he, he, he who dares wins as Rodney, and as Dale Boy says to Rodney. And uh, we're going to dare with Connie Hall tomorrow. This is much more realistic now, Ger. This, this may well win. Trained by Anthony McCann in County Monaghan, of all places. Um... And I, I think you can't overstate how important trainers like him and Andy Oliver and Tyrone are because they're in racing backwaters, but they're keeping the game alive and they're of huge interest to their locality when they have a winner. And of course, Anthony would have replaced the late Oliver Brady, um, who was really one of the, the characters of racing. And I think uh, people will fondly remember Oliver, but the show goes on in his absence and uh, Anthony's doing a good job. His horse are in good nick and uh, I think this horse has a huge chance in the 4.10. 
Okay, I, I, for it, apprentices tomorrow. In terms of go for a win bet. Are you at thirty two? Okay, it's a handicap with eighteen runners, but let's go for the win. Yeah, those um, they're good bets to have the trifecta on because it's such a big field, and that's why the dividend is so big on them. Oh yeah, yeah. If you, if you win it, obviously. Yeah, which obviously we didn't do yet. So, um, would you not just go each way and try and make a bit of money for the uh, charity? No, I want to make more money for them. Yeah, but uh, what if yeah. finishes second? Injured jockeys, they do a great job, and um, I'm not doing a particularly good job for them of late. The pressure no. is on, as you rather crudely alluded to earlier on. Keep an eye on the tote.com or indeed the tote's social media to see what dividend the trifecta pays tomorrow. Is there anything else that we should be talking about from this week? Well, the Listowel Festival starts on Sunday. Um, again, I, I, I don't know how the many... Second, the second one that you would recommend, if you had only one yeah. thing to go to, go to Listowel. There seem to be about a dozen like unique Irish meetings, like, you know, well, there's something unique about this and that. Listowel has a bunch of American sports writers who come over and just sit there and drink at this and um, talk to the descendants of John B. and experience the whole thing and then go and write these amazing epic pieces of like why this is a slice of Irlandia or whatever the Americana equivalent is. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique place and, um, you know, in fairness, it, it does have a really proud um, literary tradition and uh, um, I'm, I'm going down myself staying in Killarney, if anyone has any advice for some nice things to do in Killarney, but listen, because the store is actually very hard to get accommodation in because it's so popular. But um, How far is that trip? Uh, I think it's about 40 minutes. Right. Um, but l l they're, they're actually two very similar tracks in Killarney. Killarney's a spectacular place to go racing, but Listowel has more of a uh, kind of a, like a harvest festival farmers meeting to it like it just has a kind of a, it's, it's a very very much the grassroots very no frills like it's down to earth experience huge crowds and it used to have the monorail um, and the monorail was such that if Jerry sits there and there's nobody and um, there's an odd number of passengers they used to have to put like a bag of spuds to balance the monorail yeah right yeah that's and, mad and we all remember the simpsons episode of the monorail but there actually was a monorail in ireland and you can go to the the museum and um hopefully back the winner of the lartigue but it's a great meeting the and it's um brendan duke actually had a great line in his blog this week he was he was saying how he and um, brendan is the son of the trainer and he does blogs and media work great character in racing but he was saying how um, he was at a, a wedding once, and um, you know the way in an Irish wedding you get to the residence bar at whatever time, mad o'clock like, and uh, he was talking to an English lady. She said, we, we don't do this in England, like half twelve, one o'clock, we go to bed. And Brendan was kind of making an analogy about this in terms of Irish festivals like Galway and the Stole, which are seven days. Brendan was like, they probably were five day festivals, but people just wouldn't go home. Yeah. And I actually thought it was perfect analogy for the soul. And it's hard to go home from the soul. Yeah. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks, basically, is what you're Especially saying. Especially if you can go to the monorail uh, museum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, join us next week for more of Johnny's uh, odd obsessions. But, uh, Johnny, good stuff. Thanks very much. Enjoy we your trip. We love the train, don't we? We do love yeah. the train, yeah. Train to Laytown. Um, right. That is it from Friday Night Racing this week. We hope you've enjoyed it. We will be back. Uh, next week on the radio at 8 o'clock, next Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. If you are listening to this on the radio, make sure you subscribe to youtube.com forward slash off the ball because then you'll get notifications about the fact that we actually do Friday night racing on Friday afternoon. I realise it's a bit confusing, but uh, we think it works. We hope you're enjoying it. If you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet us at off the ball, or of course you can leave comments under the uh, live stream or indeed if you're listening to this on the radio this evening. Good man, thanks very much for joining us. 53106. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball and they're off. brought to you by Go Racing plan your day at the races at goracing.ie